Okay, so before going into what resampling methods are, we're going to start off with a small revision on probability and statistics. First, we're going to talk about what a random variable, or RV for short, is. We will ignore the formal mathematical definition of an RV and directly talk about its properties. So for a random variable x, there is a corresponding function that describes it, which is called the CDF, or cumulative distribution function, denoted as f of x, and the argument is not the random variable. It takes as argument a real number. This subscript right here is the random variable, and it is telling us that this CDF is for the random variable x. Um, it describes the random variable x to be more precise. Some references, or when we're talking about, you know, only one random variable, usually we omit x, so instead we can denote it as such. And it is defined as the probability, pr or p, both will be used throughout this lecture, and both will denote a probability of a certain event. So it is the probability that the random variable x is lower than the argument x. Two direct consequences from this definition are, if we take a look at a CDF, it should never be lower than zero because it's a probability, and at the same time, it should never exceed one. And on top of that, from the name cumulative, which means it's accumulating values and positive values, but values between zero and one. So at each x, it's as if we're adding previous values. So it serves as a memory function, if you will. It holds some memory and it will look something like this. Let's say the center zero of where this slope is happening. It varies according to the mean and, you know, other characteristics of a random variable, right? And the slope, it also depends on the standard deviation of your random variable. Okay, so this is what a CDF is. And actually, the distribution of x is completely defined or determined by the CDF. If I come and give you a CDF, then I have defined your random variable x, which means that you, using this function, you can compute any probability you want. You could derive the mean and you can derive the standard deviation even more you could derive any moment of the random variable x so regardless of x being a discrete random variable or a continuous random variable or even a mixture um, the function f will completely define it now if we're talking in the discrete case means that it takes only finite values so in that case we define also another function which is called the probability mass function so the pmf is lowercase p of x which is simply the probability that x takes on the value x so a small example would be you know x being 0 and 1 x is a binomial distribution or bernoulli distribution and it takes two values 0 or 1 with parameter p so what that means is that the probability that x is 0 is p, and probability that x is 1 is 1 minus p, right? So how can we, you know, get our PMF? Indeed, since x is discrete, then its PMF is also discrete, and it only holds two values. So p of 0 is the probability that x is 0, which is p, and p of 1 is probability that x is 1, it is 1 minus p. If I were to plot the PMF, it's only two peaks. So at 0 and at 1. Otherwise, it's 0. So over here, it's 0 because we are sure that x will never take any value other than 0 or 1. So here, it would be p. And let's say this is 1 minus p. Now, I drew 1 minus p larger than p. It depends on p. Now, this is what a PMF is. If we're in the continuous case, then instead people call it the PDF, this same function, but it has another defin well, it has another definition, yes. Um, it is called the probability density function, and it is defined as the derivative of the CDF, more formally DF by DX. 
actually you cannot evaluate this function at a point it will read I mean you could but the but the value is always zero also the PDF or the PMF will completely define or describe your function you know if I come and tell you X follows a Bernoulli distribution of parameter P it's the same as I come and tell you oh X follows the you know the CDF of a Bernoulli distribution right of parameter P or X has the PDF of the Bernoulli distribution so all three are equivalent all those notations or writings are equivalent now you know sometimes when you have two distributions X and Y then of course each has their own PDF CDF PMF of their discrete but usually when people are studying you know um, how a certain let's say environments variables are behaving or even more how they're interacting with each other then you're going to have to study the joint CDF is denoted as PXY so it's not X times Y no it's X and Y and therefore it has it is a function of two variables X and Y for short we'll denote it F uppercase of X y which is defined as the probability that the random variable x is less than the variable x and y is less than y so it is nothing other than a generalization of the univariate cdf or one dimensional cdf to the 2d case indeed you could generalize the pdf the joint PDF so instead of a you know a single derivative you have partial derivatives so in that case instead of a DX right here you will have derivative with respect to X and Y so it's a double derivative of the CDF FXY sometimes when you're talking about conditionals and I'm given a certain random variable you know I know something about another random variable given some prior information so in that case you will have to study the conditional PDF let's say you know that X is equal to small x you know it hence you would like to compute the probability of Y knowing this information X or probability of y given that x is x so this is again a function right um, and it is the joint PDF divided by the PDF of x so this comes from p of a given b is p of a and b right and b over p of b and usually you will find that p of x is denoted as or replaced with the marginal density function because it is obtained by marginalizing the joint PDF with respect to Y now the discrete case you will have you know same notations and everything but instead of an int integration you will have a summation of P of X and Y okay now that we have defined what a random variable is and some of its related functions like the CDF PMF and PDF let's talk about the expected value of a random variable so for a function g of x this is a normal function going possibly from R to R the quantity g of uppercase x where x is a random variable will also be a random variable so it's as if I have a random variable x let's say a binomial or a Bernoulli distribution and I define a certain function let's say g of x is as simple as x plus 1 let's keep it simple so this is another random variable g of x you can call it y right and it takes values if x is you know switching 0 and 1 then y would switch 1 and 2 right so it belongs in the set 1 and 2 as simple as that containing 1 and 2 as simple as that so you could regard a function of x as another random variable so this quantity will also be a random variable and its expected value expectation of g of x 
is defined as follows. So in case g of x or x is continuous, then this guy is an integration from minus infinity to plus infinity of g of x, this time the function, right, multiplied by the pdf of x. This is the case where x is continuous. And on the other hand, when x is discrete, you know, you have the sum where k belongs to all possible values of x. So let's say it's the set that looks like fancy x is all values that x takes. It is the summation of g of k multiplied by p of k. Now, you know, the values are not necessarily integers. So from this definition, you can define the expectation of x. So this is the case where your g of x is, you know, replaced by x. So expectation of x is nothing other than the integration of what is g of x right now? It's just x. It's right here. So x, p of x, dx. And similarly, if x is discrete, you will have the summation of x and fancy x of x, p of x. So expectation of g of x is the general case. So some properties or consequences are the following. You can actually prove that any linear combination of random variables. Then you take the expectation, well, this guy is equal to the summation of alpha k, expectation of g k of x. So a simple example would be, let's look at the case where, you know, we only have two terms, so alpha 1, g 1 of x, plus alpha 2, g 2 of x, right? And I take the expectation of this guy, well, you can write it as follows alpha 1 expectation of g1 of x plus that of alpha 2 g2 of x. So this property tells you that E, the operator E, is linear. This is one property. Another property is when your variables, let's say you have n random variables, x1 down to xn, right? And they're all independent from each other. So if that's the case, then the expectation of x1 times x2 times x3 down to xn is equal to the expectation of x1 times the expectation of x2 all the way down to xn. So this is the case when x1 down to xn are independent. And even more than that, even more than that, the variance of the sum of weighted and independent random variables is the sum of a k square var of x k. So what is a variance? It is nothing other than, if I define the var of x, it is nothing other than the expectation again, but this time not of x, of x minus mu square. So we know how to compute this thanks to the definition right here. So now your g of x is x minus mu all square. And what is mu? So it is nothing other than the mean of x or the expectation of x. So we talked about the expectation, the variance, so order one, order two. Now let's go down to cross orders. <laughs> so so cross interaction between two variables, x and y. So let's say I have x where the expectation of x is denoted by mu subscript x and random variable y where the expectation of y is mu lowercase y as such. Variance of x as usually and most probably you will find that the variance of x is denoted as sigma x squared. Sigma x is the standard deviation. Square, you get the variance. And variance of y is sigma y square. Given x and y, its mean and its variance, you know, you can define the covariance of x and y. And what is it? It is nothing other than the expectation of... So instead of having an x minus mu square, you would split the squares, and one time it will be for x, the other time it will be for y. So x minus mu x multiplied by y minus mu y. And that takes us to a 
another quantity which is super important and it's called Pearson's correlation coefficient or simply Pearson's correlation and it's denoted as rho of xy and it is equal to by definition and this is also by definition and this is also by definition <laughs> so it is equal to covariance of xy divided by sigma x times sigma y or the square roots of the variance of x times the variance of y so one last thing we talk about before moving on to the next subtopic is conditional expectation so the conditional expectation of y given x equal to a certain value or lowercase x is a random variable in x okay or g of x with that being said, we go up to the definition that we talked about here and just apply it. In that case, you would have that it is the integration of y, p of y given x, dy. Okay, now let's move on to some famous distributions, whether they're discrete or continuous. So let's start off with discrete. You've got the Bernoulli got the binomial distribution and the Poisson. And what is a Bernoulli distribution of parameter p and usually denoted as x follows Bernoulli of, with parameter p? We defined it up here when we were talking about or giving an example of a discrete PMF, right? We fully defined it here, so no need to go down here and write it. Whenever we write x follows b of p, it means that x is a Bernoulli distribution with parameter p, which also means that the probability that x takes on a value 1 is p, and the probability that x takes on another value is 1 minus p. Actually, if I flip p with 1 minus p, the meaning of a Bernoulli distribution is still reserved. Bernoulli only focuses on two values, so a, a binary random variable. Now, a binomial distribution could be seen as a generalization of a Bernoulli distribution or in other words, a multi-level Bernoulli distribution. You know, you can define Sn as a sum of Bernoulli distributions, xk, where k is going from 1 to n, where each xk is a Bernoulli distribution with parameter p. And what does that mean? It means that, you know, since you're summing up random variables that take on values 0 and 1, that means this is at least 0 and at most n, and it could take on values 1, 2, 3, up to n. So Sn belongs to 0, 1, 2, down to n. Are they equiprobable? No, they're not. The probability that x takes on any value k is determined by the following equation. So it's n choose k, or denoted as ckn times p to the power k times 1 minus p power n minus k. And what is n choose k? It is n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial. This number is telling you how many combinations you could choose k elements out of n. And how is a binomial distribution denoted? So in a better you would say it follows b of p. In a binomial, you would say that x, or in that case s of n, would follow a binomial, but it's not only determined by p, right? So if I come and tell you, oh, I want a binomial distribution with parameter p, you didn't fully describe your binomial distribution. You need one more piece of information, which is n. And n is usually referred to as trials. And last thing here I'm going to talk about is the Poisson which is denoted as Poisson or sometimes P of lambda. So there's only one parameter that defines a Poisson distribution, which is lambda. And what is the probability that X takes on a value K? It is lambda to the power K, E minus lambda over K factorial. And here, what are the set of values X could you know, come from? This fancy X would be the set 0, 1, 2, down till infinity. Now you see the distinction here. Your fancy x here would be only 0 and 1. Your fancy x here would be 0, 
one, two, up till n, and Poisson extends down to infinity. So you see why those three are, you know, famous? <laughs> one is binary, one is multi-level, if you will, and the other one is, you know, integer but infinite. Okay, that's all I have to say for the famous distributions that are discrete. Let's go to the continuous ones and mention also three famous random variables. So the first one I'd like to start with is the uniform distribution. Now, what is a uniform distribution? It means that, you know, the probability that X takes on values, that's not precise because the probability that X takes on a value is zero because X is continuous. So the probability that X, you know, falls in intervals in the larger interval AB are equiprobability. So the PDF of x in that case is written as follows it is 1 over b minus a if x falls between a and b and 0 else so it looks something like this this is a and this is b where a is smaller than b and the amplitude of this pulse is 1 over b minus a usually people also write this instead of you know you having to write two line description of p of x you can instead write one over b minus a times an indicator function and it is understood that indicator function is one whenever the event is true and zero else or sometimes the event is written as a subscript of i so this is one continuous random variable I'd like to talk about. Another one would be the normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution. It is denoted as x follows n of two parameters, mu and sigma square. As simple as that, it's mean and it's variance. So here the mean is not one of a or b and the variance is not one of a and b, no. Instead, the mean of a uniform distribution is clearly you can see it geometrically, it's a plus b over 2. Don't ever do, do this geometrically. You have to like use the definition we talked about of the expectation. And the variance would be something like b minus a over 12, something like that. You have to derive it from scratch. In contrast, a normal distribution is described by its mean and its variance. And its PDF is the following. So 1 over root 2 pi sigma square spec exponential of negative x minus mu square over 2 sigma square. It looks complicated, but when you come, you know, and draw it, it's really nice to look at. So this is mu right here, and it looks like a bell. Sigma square will determine how flat or sharp this peak is. Of course, the smaller sigma square is, the more this guy will squeeze towards mu. Okay, and the last continuous distribution I'd like to talk about is the exponential distribution. It is denoted as x follows exp or exponential of lambda, like Poisson, <laughs> lambda, but it takes only values. So in contrast to the uniform, which takes only values between a and b, and the normal, which takes on values in r, the exponential distribution takes on values in r plus so the interval zero plus infinity and its pdf is described as follows it's lambda e minus lambda x now it looks something like this if x is zero you have lambda right here and it decreases and you know the rate of decay depends on lambda the higher lambda is, the faster the decay. Of course, you can use the indicator function to write it in another way. So lambda e minus lambda x times i of x when it's positive. Otherwise, it's zero. Okay, let's hop on to the next subtopic where I'm going to give you some useful theorems. Those theorems are everywhere in statistics. They form the foundation. For I describe two, two theorems that are related to the convergence of certain probability distributions or random variables, we're going to define two types of convergence. We've got convergence in distribution and we've also got convergence in probability. In both cases, let's say, you know, we've got a bunch of random variables, right? So x1 down to xn. So when do we say that we have convergence in 
probability. So for any sequence of random variables x1 down to xn and even more, we say xn converges in probability to a fixed number mu if for every epsilon positive the quantity xn minus mu greater than epsilon. Now, of course, this is an event, right? Xn's are random. So we talk about their probability and therefore the name convergence in probability is zero in the limits. Okay, that's it. This writing is equivalent to or is usually denoted as Xn converges to mu. This is the, the definition of, you know, the convergence in in real analysis this is how you define you know a, a convergence of a certain real sequence but you don't have a notion of probability the only difference is that here we insert a probability and this will allow you to say my random sequence conversion to a number mu in probability so p here stands for convergence in probability in other words we say xn converges in probability if the distribution is concentrating at the target point mu. If your random variables at the limit are getting closer and closer to a point mu. Now on the other hand, we say that a sequence of CDFs, f1 down to fn and even more, those are the CDFs of a sequence of random variables, x1 down to xn, and even more. So given that, we say that a random variable x with CDF f, so given that, we say that xn conversions and distribution to a random variable x, so d, which means conversions and distribution, if the following criterion is true. So the limit as n goes to infinity of the CDFs is equal to f of x. So all those random variables are converging to one random variable x. If the following is true, the limit of their CDFs converges to the CDF of the limit. This means that you have convergence in distribution. Now, this gives rise to two important theorems. Theorem 1 is the law of large numbers LLN. It is also termed the weak law of large numbers, weak, the weak version. So if I have x1 down to xn are IID, so IID means independent and identically distributed. Independent, we talked about independence through the expectation, and identical means all of them have the same distribution. So if I have those random variables and if mu is their expectation so since they're identical means all of them have the same expectation mu which is finite then the random variable defined as the sample mean now i'm going to have people telling me oh but this is not random this is you know this is fixed no it's not it is a sum of random variables and therefore it is a function of random variables and therefore it is random let's say n is two you have two random variables then you're telling me x1 plus x2 over 2 is not random anymore. Why not? Okay, so this again is random. And what does the weak law of large numbers tell us? Simply, this random variable converges in probability to the mean. And what does that mean? What does this statement mean? We have it right here. Now the other theorem, which is theorem 2, it is the central limit theorem, the CLT. So again, if I have n iid random variables with mean mu and variance sigma square. Again, all their means is mu and all their variances is sigma square because they're iid. Then you could say the following. The quantity square root of n of xn bar minus mu over sigma. This quantity is kind of, you know, centering the random variable xn bar, you subtract by the mean, and therefore the mean of xn bar minus mu is zero, then you divide by the standard deviation, which means that the variance of this quantity is one, so mean zero, standard deviation one, this is a sample mean. xn bar is defined right here, it's the same xn bar we're talking about. So this quantity 
will converge in distribution to what? In distribution, we're talking about conversions in the sense of random variables, not in a sense of point. So when you say, oh, my random variable is converging, okay, let's be more precise here. Is it converging to a point or is it converging in distribution? Of course, the second one gives you more information. It tells you how your random variable will behave in the limits. This guy right here will converge to the normal distribution, which is the standard normal distribution. When we say standard, it means the mean is zero and the variance is one. You can see the CLT is a stronger version of the weaker LLN because Let's be more real here. Let's be more real. So if 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 I take this same x n bar, I subtract it from mu, you know, and I divide by sigma over root n, whatever, and I study the convergence in probability, I will get zero. But this is more descriptive. This is telling you it's not only zero, but you will have some you know fluctuation around zero, and this fluctuation is described by sigma square which is one this is where you're going to and this is super powerful this is like a global theorem you grab any n iid random variables you could say this for any iid so whether the x1 down to xn are poisson or beta or f distribution student t distribution i don't know where they come from potato distribution no matter what they have to be identical means that they should be drawn from the same distribution therefore they should have the same mean and variance and on top of that they should be independent and you can say this the sample mean scaled and centered will converge in distribution to the normal distribution that's how powerful this is okay now it's time to welcome you to the world of estimators and estimation theory and the goal here is simply to estimate a certain parameter so let's say i have n random variables x1 down to xn that are drawn from a certain pdf or cdf f my random variables are drawn or generated another keyword here is generated they're generated from this distribution so this is how you interpret f so you interpret it as the population distribution we are sampling from so f is like a sampler and the samples are x so any numerical quantity or even non-numeric it could be a distribution as well but now let's be let's let's keep things simple so any numerical quantity of f that we are interested in is called the parameter of interest for example if i were to estimate the mean of f then the parameter of interest is the mean if my goal is to estimate the median of f parameter of interest is the median other parameters worth mentioning are the first quartile second quartile i don't know what quartile whatever you want the parameter of interest could even be a distribution so your goal is to estimate not only one number which is a mean or a bunch of variables right you could also estimate densities or functions right so parameters of interest could be mean medians or even functions such as you know you can estimate a certain cdf as well or if you're in the world of biostatistics and medical research usually the goal is to estimate something called the survival function so sft which is nothing other than the complement of the cdf so it's one minus fft which means that it's the probability that x is larger than t in some fields it's called the ccdf or the complement cumulative density function or i don't know if you're into q theory or you're studying markov chains and stuff like that it tells you the rate of success of a certain variable because it's reporting the probability that this variable is above a certain threshold now when we know or we assume that f 
is a certain distribution with some parameters. When I come and tell you your data or your random variables are generated from a certain f, then the parameter of interest can be the parameter describing that distribution. For example, if we assume that f is an exponential distribution, so if my f is written as follows, with unknown lambda, so the parameter lambda is unknown, then this parameter might be the parameter of interest. Maybe that's what you're interested or most likely that's what you will be interested in. So in statistical terms, the question is the following. We're trying to solve the following problem. So given the parameter of interest, how can I, the statistician, use the random sample to infer? So after you estimate your parameter of interest, your goal would be how can I explain or fit or whatever you're doing with a random variable using this parameter of interest. Okay. So if we let theta, which is the parameter of interest, and it is a function of your CDF be the parameter of interest, let theta hat be a statistic or more formally theta n hat because n, the, the quality of estimate it's usually a function of how many random variables I have. If you're estimating using only one random variable, it's different than taking all into account because you have more information. Therefore, you will not have the same quality of estimation. That makes sense. Let the tan hat be a statistic. So what is a statistic? It is a function of the random sample x1 down to xn. So statistic is a function. So that's what you're given, huh? And what is it used for? It's used to estimate theta. As simple as that. We say in this case that theta n hat is an estimator. It is one possible estimator. There is infinitely many estimators. I don't know how bad, how good they are. Okay. And for an estimator, there's two important quantities that report how good this estimator is. The first one is called the bias. So from the name bias, it tells you how far you are from the parameter of interest. So a bias of your estimator is defined as the expectation of your estimator because of course, and as we said before, any function of random variables is again random. Therefore, you could compute the mean, the variance, whatsoever moment you could out of your random variable. So it is the mean of the estimator subtracted by the true value or the parameter of interest. This captures the systematic deviation of the estimator from its target value. Now the other quantity, which is also super important, tells you how good of an estimate you are. So it's called the variance. Simple as that. So the variance of theta n hat, we would like to have usually an unbiased estimator. So in average, our estimator should be theta. So in that case, if it's zero, we say we have an unbiased estimator when the bias is zero. And the variance, the lower it is, the less your estimator is fluctuating around its mean. This measure tells you the size of stochastic fluctuations. It, it tells you how much, how many fluctuations you have. So a, a direct example right here would be, let's say I have n random variables coming out of f that are iid as well. They have a mean mu and a variance sigma square. So let's say my objective here is to estimate parameter of interest, which is mu. So this is my goal. I would like to estimate mu. A natural estimator that would pop up into anyone's head is the sample mean. So you would come and tell me, oh, so I, I'm going to pick the following. This is the way I would do it. So it is nothing other than the average of my random variables. Okay, why not? <laughs> So let's, let's see how good of an estimator this is. Meaning that, let's see its bias. It is the expectation of theta n hat by definition minus theta. So using the linearity of the expectation, I could write it as follows, minus the true value, which is mu. Now what is exk? It is mu using the definition. So you will get one over n and you're summing up n constants. So again, you have n mu minus mu. This quantity would be zero. And thus, you will conclude that this estimator, i.e. the sample mean, 
is unbiased. Now let's compute its variance, then hat, so the variance of 1 over n, summation of x, k, right? So any constant you grab and you, you know, extract it outside your variance, it, it, it's, it's extracted as a square. You'll get 1 over n square. And since your x, k's are, you know, independent, I didn't write it here, but let's say they're IID, then you will get a sum of variances of xk. Now, what is the variance of xk? It's given to be sigma square. Summing it up, you will get 1 over n square. Summing up a constant n times, you will get n sigma square. In the end, you will get sigma square over n. So, what do we conclude from here? We can observe as n goes to infinity, the variance goes to 0. The bias is always zero no matter what n is. And thus, we say if the bias of my estimator goes to zero and the variance as well goes to zero, both as the sample size n goes to infinity, we say that theta n hat converges in probability to the true value, which is the parameter of interest, theta. In other words, this is equivalent to saying that the n hat is a consistent estimator of theta, okay? Okay, so that's what a consistent estimator is. Now, that's not only a criterion for, you know, evaluating. You've got another one which reports the quality of the estimator, and it is called the mean square error, or MSE. An MSE of an estimator is the expectation of its square error. So mean square error. Now, using some algebraic manipulation, so I could write this as such. So right here, I could subtract the mean of my estimator and I can add it again, minus theta, all square. And I could split it as follows. So a plus b square is a square plus 2ab plus b square, right? Take this to be your b and this to be your a, and therefore you can write it as follows. So you will get theta n hat minus e of theta n hat square plus 2ab. Remember that the expectation is linear plus the expectation of b square. Okay, now notice here that the expectation is a constant. So this term right here is a constant and that's why we split you know this thing up because the expectation is a constant and the true parameter is assumed to or is a constant we're not estimating densities right now okay so that's why we splitted this expectation right here so we could remove this expectation and even more the expectation right here you get the expectation of theta and hat minus expectation of expectation which doesn't make sense because Already, this is a constant, so it's, again, the expectation of theta n hat, and therefore this term is a zero. You will end up with the first term, which is the variance of theta n hat, right? And the second term, which is a constant, and therefore the expectation goes out, or is it? It doesn't make it's, it's it's useless. This is the bias square. So this quantity is always positive, and this quantity is always positive. Therefore, the MSE is always positive. Another way to see why it's always positive is that it's a variance. So the MSE of any estimator is defined as, again, consists of two parts, the variance plus the bias. So this decomposition, let's put it that way, it's called the bias variance trade-off. Because in all applications, most probably, your goal is to minimize MSE. And in case you have a bias, you always have a variance. But in case you have a bias, then you would, you would have to face this trade-off right here, which is the bias variance trade-off. When you're minimizing this, you're going to have to find a balance between your variance and your bias. Now, what happens if my MSE is good, meaning that it's going to zero with increasing n, let's say. It means that again you're having a consistent estimator because if this quantity is going to zero it means that both quantities the variance and the bias are going to zero because if you're summing up two positive quantities and their sum is going to zero then each and every term is going to zero so that means that i have a consistent estimator using this right 
because the bias variance are going to zero and thus I'm having a consistent estimator. So this is in probability theory, the convergence of MSE is also called L2 convergence because you're converging in an L2 sense right here. The, the MSE, the expectation of theta and half minus theta square L2 is converging. You have other types of convergence, of course. So this could be replaced with an absolute value and therefore an L1 convergence. Something worth noting here is that when we write theta of f, so when we write this, it means that the parameter of interest is derived from the population distribution f, which means that you could write your parameter of interest from the CDF. So in case I have, I don't know, a CDF that looks like this, simple as that, and you're estimating a, or let me remove b, right? You could write a as a function of your CDF. How will you just write a is f of x over x? As simple as that. Thus, we can say that the parameter of interest theta is a function of a function. This is g of f of x because you're just, you know, taking f of x and you're dividing it by x. It's a functional. It's a function of a function. So g of f of x and x. It's a function of both. Okay, so that's about it. Okay, now let's do some R coding. Now, I've got R Studio open right here in front of me in case you don't have it. You can just visit this website right here. I'll make sure I'll leave the link in the description below. So what is what basically is R Studio? There you have it right here. It's it's really dedicated towards the statistical world, right? So pe people that are really involved in statistics, estimation, data science as well, machine learning, whether you're dealing with big data sets or not, it's, it's really a nice tool to use. It's built with, with the intent to help people working with large data. So you just download the free version, you don't need the commercial one, the open source, I don't know, it depends on your application, whether you're employing R into servers, right, or Server Pro, you can learn more about it here if you want. Anyways, if you if you want to download the free version, get this. If you're using a Windows, you just go ahead and click here. Mac OS, this one, Ubuntu, and Fedora. Okay, so after you download it, you have our studio open here. You open a notebook. If you're if you're writing a normal R file, you will have a .R, so it's just this R script. A notebook is made for you to, you know, organize comments and see the output of a snippet of code, which is called here a chunk. So a chunk is just some code right here. We'll see what, what, what it does. So to open a notebook, all you have to do is go to file, then notebook, our notebook right here. You will get this once you open a notebook. You can erase all that. You don't need it and you can click on preview, so you get an empty notebook. And right here, you're ready to start typing some code. Okay, so let me show you what, what I mean by comments and chunks and so. This is my first chunk. Now this, what I wrote right here is not code. This is just a comment, okay? So in case I view it, so I click here on net, just get some text, some useless text. In case you want code, insert, and as you can see, our studio supports Python, RCPP, SQL, and Bash. You get this chunk of code. So let's see what I get. So one plus one, run, you get two. And to preview this on your notebook, there you have it. This is the output of the corresponding input. So that being said, you can use R as a basic calculator. You can perform computations as such. You can, to, to, to execute this chunk of code right here, all you have to do is hit on a Mac, Command, Shift, Enter, and on Windows, it, the equivalent operation would be, I think, Control, Shift, and Enter. You can see here, it's not updated on the notebook, on the viewer. You have to hit Knit right here so that you see it. So this is a multiplication. The subtraction would be this, division would be this, right? We also have exponentiation as such. 
okay if this is getting too messy for you you hit shift enter or you can just click here or here and insert another chunk of R code now let's define a variable X you can define it as such an R so let's say my X is 3 right so X is 3 nothing to display let's hit run yeah nothing to display in case you want to see what's going on here just see X has been assigned the value 3 the equivalent of this operation is X equal 3 right run don't see anything that you get an error what is the editor telling you attempt to use zero length variable why oh my bad so right here i was you know typing outside the chunk so chunk is defined as such so let me go back here and say x is three run net you get x is three so both of those operations are equivalent okay to see that this is one and this is two so both of them are the same so less than and dash is the equivalent of the equal. Let's do some other operations such as, I don't know, maybe you would like to do the log of two power four. As you can see here, I have some auto completion. So you've got all those logs. You have their description right here. This is super useful. Um, you have log to the base 10. So let's say the log to the base 10 of 100, which would be two. Let's see what other stuff we have. Log 1p, log computes logarithms. By default, match logarithms log 10 to base 10, log 2 to base 2, and log 1p should be to base, to any base. So as you can see here, we have x, and we have another input, which by default is set to the exponential. So in case I go ahead and say the log of exponential 1 should be 1, unless I come and explicitly change the log, now my log is to base 3. To verify, let's take 3 square, should return 2. So those are basic operations. You've got the exponential. You've got sines and cosines. Also got the pi, which is a constant. Therefore, its sine would be a 0. This is a round off error by R. Very good. Now, with that being said, let's create some vectors. How do I do that? Well, it's super easy on R. My vector, let's say it is a two size two vector, so C three five as such. Run, no error. Let's print it out. Three five as such. Net in case you want to update your notebook. There you have it. So this is how you define a vector. Let's say you want something faster. So let's say you have a certain structure in your vector. So 1 to 10 would return you a vector from 1 to 10. Now let's see how to create a matrix. Insert our code. So matrix A, let's say, is using up the matrix function. So as you can see here, it's telling you what to input. So let's go back here again. It's telling you the data you hover over here the data is the first argument then the number of rows number of columns and the others are actually all are optional except the data actually all are optional so if i go ahead and just display it it's an empty array or an empty matrix in case i want a two by three matrix let's say that contains the following values i have to do this so number of rows number of columns run and there you have it one two three four five six so you input the first argument as a vector and this is understood that i want a two by three matrix out of this vector now let's see what happens when i go ahead and type in the following so matrix again let's say i want one to ten but this time n row to be two right so run so automatically it will generate a two by five without having to say ah oh, i want a five column matrix because that's what it would do with a 10 sized vector in case i have an 11 right here let's see what happens you get an error or it's not an error this is a warning it it's telling you you're, you're giving me an odd or yeah an odd length vector i'm going to insert a one here for you to make it even if i say 11 run return a column vector let's keep it 10 let's keep it i mean 2 as such and what happens if i 
change it to colon, returns six by two size matrix. Now let's say I have another matrix, each, let's say column, it has a certain description. Like it's not any arbitrary matrix, no. Say this matrix is extracted from an Excel file and each column has a certain description or called attribute. What do I mean by that? So let's take the matrix B that I had here and let's give a, you know, a name for each column, right? So all I have to do is call call names or column names, pass it the matrix B and give them some names. So let's say the first one is ID and the second one is age. Okay. Run. Nothing happens. Run now. As you can see right here, the attributes have changed. What does that mean? I could do something like this, okay? How can I extract useful values as such? So this is how the B looks like. One, one is the element sitting here. One, two would be the age. One, three is an adder. Two, one is two right here. We do something like this. Yes, we could. So remember my B at this moment looks like this. And therefore, if I want to extract the age column, it looks like this, right? So row, column, if I don't indicate which row, it means I want all this column. Otherwise, I would extract the corresponding row element. Good, let's create now a list. Let's see how the notebook looks like right now. Really messy, getting really messy, okay. Okay, let's talk about lists. Let's say I have a list L, which is list, and the first element it contains some vector. The second element it has my matrix B right here, and in the third element it has a function log running that print run. As you can see right here, this list has three elements. They're indexed as such, so double brackets. First element, it has this vector. Second one, it has the matrix. The third one, it has the function. And how is this useful? You can go ahead and extract them as such. You get the first element. You can index. Now, if you go ahead to the second element, you have the matrix, which you could index as such. So second row, the age should return a seven. And to use the third, element which is the log function you just pass it values right so log of one should be zero that's how lists are useful now let's jump to creating data frames let's define a data frame d data dot frame that's how you define a data frame let's pass it the matrix b i had let's see how it looks like so this is a better description of you know b so in case you would like to, you know, extract values, you use the dollar sign. So d.id, you get the vector. d.a, you get the other vector. Let's see if we can add some attributes. So month is equal to October. Let's see if it works with one. With one attribute. So let's see how d looks like. October is assigned to all my previous values, right? So if I pass it November as such, I get an error. Let's see if I pass other values, like five values which are compatible. As you can see, each one is assigned to its corresponding value, right? Now I can go ahead and extract it as such. That's it for data frames. Now, let me go ahead and type in the word faithful. It's not what it, it's not faithful. <laughs> it's, the, it's a data set called faithful. Let me run that, and there you have the data set. I didn't do anything to, you know, generate the data or I don't know what. It's just stored, it's built in. So you can go ahead and go and check the data right here. It has eruptions, waiting. So in case you want to have a small description of data set faithful, you can use the head function. And what the head function does is that it returns the first or last parts of a vector matrix table or data frame. Um, by the way, this is a data frame. So run, look at this beautiful design. So you get the head right here. This is the head. And this is the whole data frame. So the head gives you the first, you know, six values. 
Let's see if there's something like Python, which is the tail. Yeah, the tail returns the last six values. So the head and the tails of the data frame. Now we have a good description. We have the most basic elements that were discussed. We can go ahead and plot, right? So we discussed basic operators, some useful functions, how to define a vector, a matrix, how to extract values. You can also go back up here and change values. So I go here, I have this B right here. I can say, oh, I don't want a two right here. I want it to be the value times 10. So it's sitting at row two, column one, and I want it to be the same value, but multiplied by 10, run, and print. There you have it. Now, if I go down here, I have to run it again to take place because here we're using B. And therefore, the, to update D, you need to run it again. Run. Let's take a look at D. And as you can see here, it's 20. So you have to run it again. Make sure of that. So let's insert head here. This is the data frame, head, tail. So we worked with heads and tails as well of data frames. You could extract a whole column, right, as such. Here you have two columns, eruptions and waiting, right? It's the whole column and waiting, right? So I need to update the notebook. You can see the notebook is getting messy, right? See here that the live notebook, the RMD file, is really well structured. Okay, um, let's do some visualizations right so again I have the faithful data um, let's say I would like to see a histogram of the first column how do I do that well all I have to do is call hist and then you know extract the eruptions with the dollar sign run and there you have the histogram of the values that fall inside the eruption vector, column vector of faithful. You can also do the same thing with the other column. As you can see here, look at this. Look at the beautifulness of RStudio. Like, could you have it more organized, really? It's really, really organized. You get tabs right here where you could switch through your plots. So I'm going to minimize this a bit because I'm not using it. There you go. This is the histogram of eruptions, this is a histogram of weightings. Let's see what else we can do with the hist function. There's other parameters here you could play with. So press F1 for help, um, F1. And here you get a description. So you don't have to go and Google hist. You have it right here. So it's telling you that, you know, you can pass in other parameters right here. Here's the description. If you want, you can go ahead and read about it. I'll leave that to you. Let's say, same thing, I want eruptions, but I want my breaks attribute to be 20. What does that do? Run, and as you can see right here, let me increase it to 100 so that you see what I mean. It's the number of bins, the histogram bins. So the more you have, the more discretized the histogram. You turn it to 20. You can also play with the attribute called call. So it's a color to be used to fill the bars. So let's use orchid, which is one type of coloring. Run. There you have it. Okay. You can use other values or sky blue as such or blue. Use red. It's just a color. Now this is how you plot histograms. What if you would like to just have a scatter plot of your values, right? So you have a two column data frame. So one could be the X value, the other could be the Y value. How do we do that? All you have to do is just, you know, plot, right? So plot faithful as such. As you can see here, it's, it's each row is a point on this plot, right? And other stuff you can do with plot. Again, click here, F1. There you have it. You have all this description. You pass it those X label, Y label. So let's say you want the X label. You don't want eruptions. You would like to call it, I don't know, um, X axis. There you have it. You have control over that. You would like to change 
y label to y axis there you have it but i don't want that because i think this description is better so that's what's good about data frames that you know they're they're the column is de describing itself so and therefore plot would understand that if you're passing if you're giving me a data frame then if the columns are labeled then voila i will label their corresponding axis what other attributes do we have let me do another plot with faithful let's change the color i would like a lime green for example this is what you get green this is what you have sky blue okay let's say you would like to give it a name so main this is a scatter that's the title of your plot um what other attributes do we have Let's see right here as you can see here you have examples so go ahead and you know just copy paste an example to learn more about it so i'm going to copy paste this line of code run here it's plotting the sign function let's see this what it does i think i'm going to get an editor no, I'm not. <laughs> so here we get something like candle. No, it's not a candle plot. It's a discrete distribution plot. Okay. You can really learn like how to do it by yourself, really. You know, just plot in examples, read every attribute, see how it makes sense. That's good. Okay, I'll leave that. That looks fancy. <laughs> okay, now that's it for the plot. Really? Let's talk about box plots. Oh, and by the way, um, if you generate the notebook right here also see the plots that's also nice and you can see the code and the plot so let's say I would like a box plot of the eruptions column this is what you get say you would like another one but this time for the waiting this is what you get good you can also learn about it hit F1 there you have it let's go down here to examples Let's copy paste this as well see what it does it did not plot it you should go back up here let's let's try this let's try this um, there you have it so which means that if i go ahead and do box plot of all faithful it would have two boxes one would be for the eruptions and the other one would be for weightings now like gray call as well like plot like um histogram you can color your boxes in the box plot as such say i want them to be black which is not a good color here I'll turn it to sky blue i love this color <laughs> um let's give it a title x label let's see if it has it i don't think it's going to work oh, it does yes it does X axis. Okay, that's it for box plots. Really, that's all the stuff related to visualization. One last thing is that when you have a certain function, you can just go ahead and plot it. As simple as that. Let me show you what I mean. Plotting functions. So you have a certain function you would like to see how it looks like. See, I have my x axis. Let's talk about sequence. What is what is SEQ? It's a sequence generation. It generates regular sequences by the way that you could you could define normal vectors as well so one two three four five or i don't know one to a hundred and say that my y is exponential x as such right this works run and it works and therefore i could you know plot x versus y and this is how it looks like okay so in case you're working with vectors no problem this is not only you know dedicated to data sets or sequence generation so it starts from it takes the following you know from minus 5 to 5 by 0 0.1 steps so you see values from minus 5 to 5 and the steps are 0 0.1 so if you've ever worked with python or matlab this is the equivalent of line space your y let's say it's a function so log absolute of x plus 2 maybe run now let's plot x and y here you can see the log absolute x plus 2 um, i'm going to go here and i'm going to write this is a comment huh plotting f of x is log x plus 2 and here i have a vert and a vert now don't panic don't panic what is this it's magic <laughs> so if you've ever worked with latex 
this is LaTeX code. So you can actually insert LaTeX functions into your notebook. Let me show you here. Net scroll down. There you have LaTeX code implemented in your notebook. Simple as that. So that's what we're viewing right here. Log apps x plus two. So x label would be or x lab would be x y lab would be log apps x plus two. Say I don't want this color. I want a color which is purple. You can also control the type of your plot. So I want lines instead of you know dots. That's better. You can control your line width. Let's say I want it to be 10. It's too heavy. By default, it's 1, right? Let me remove it. Run. It's 1. Okay, it looks good. Okay, so far so good. We've learned all the basics of using R, starting from operations and vectors, matrices, lists, data frames, going down to built-in data frames as well. We learned how to plot histograms, scatter plots, also box plots, and even plotting functions. So now let's see how R is used when we're working with probability or statistics. Let's start with normal random variables. So how do we do that or how do we generate normal variables? Let's say I want a vector size 10 which contains values that are generated from a normal random generator. So I'll call our norm. I'll just pass 10, so it's a standard normal print x. If I want to be more, you know, visual, I'll, I'll plot a histogram of x. Let's be more accurate. There you have it. So the more n is, the closer the histogram will look compared to the PDF of a normal distribution. So let's say I want my... So here we could see it more clearly. So with more discretized values, a thousand is a lot, a hundred is a good value. Let's say 80. There you have it. It looks so clean. It's a centered normal distribution. Now let me change the mean, right? Let me set it to two and let's see what happens. This cluster should be shifted towards two, right? run and there you have it let's put a smaller standard deviation 0.1 you can see the values are closer let's return it back to one the curve tends to be fatter 0.0001 you can see that the values are approaching to more and more okay good this is a normal distribution with mean two we're visualizing it using the histogram, we're visualizing the values, we're, we're binning the values, if you will. Okay, let's update my net right here. Now, let's see other norm functions. So let's see what the denorm does. So denorm. So R is, is a good way to keep it in your head as such. So R norm is telling you it's a random generator. Denorm will return the density. D for density. So let's say here I pass it, let's do something like this. Does it work? Yes, it does. And let's plot it using the normal plot command as such. This is not properly scaled and the reason is because I didn't pass it though the, the x-axis. So the x-axis should be also from minus 10 till 10 as such, okay? So this is the density, the, the PDF right here we're talking about the normal distribution over here it's this guy right here this is the density or pdf you're evaluating this density using the d norm so yeah that's it. it it it's evaluating it means zero variance one if you want to change it well let's change the line first so type l to have a line you can see it's not nice, it's, 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 it's sharp because I don't have a lot of values. So for that, I need the seek, the sequence. So SEQ, let's say from minus 10 till 10 by steps of 01, and I'll copy paste this here. There you have it. Let's say you'd like to change the, the mean, right? So the mean is 1, it's shifted, the density is shifted, 
put it to 5, it's at 5, let's put it at minus 5, it's at minus 5, right? S D is 1, let's set it to 0.1, get it sharper and sharper. At the limit, you will get a Dirac function, right? So please don't mix up between R norm and D norm. R norm, you're generating instances of your normal distribution. D norm, you're just evaluating the PDF at those values, right? Let's see what happens when this is bigger. You can see it's too big. Let's put it two, now three, two, as such, 1.5. Let's go on to the exponential random variable. Let's see how to generate values from the exponential random variable. So my x right now is r. You see you have all those functions starting with r. So r exponential is the function I'm looking for. Again, you have d and r. r, let's say I need a thousand values and let's plot the histogram. And as you can see, it's an exponential distribution. This is what we're looking at. Of course, of course, times the indicator function when x is positive, because it's all taking positive values. Now to plot it, I'll copy paste this code right here, and I'll just change d norm to d exponential. So d exponential as such. And it's giving you an error, and guess why? Because it doesn't work for negative values. Or no, it's because we don't have a mean and but for negative values, it's zero, right? So what could we work with? We could, you could work with the rate. It's the lambda. Set it to two. Set it to ten. As you can see, it decays faster and faster. Set it to 01, slowly decaying. 05, okay, is one is faster, right? Okay, good. Let's say you want a different color. They have a cayenne here. Yes, it's too bright. Sky blue again. Okay, not bad. And if you want a line width of 5, that's the exponential distribution. If you're not satisfied with the number of bins, we can easily change it right here. Put 100, there you have it, okay? You could also, indeed, change the rate to, let's say, 01. You can see the values decaying faster and faster. Let's jump to another distribution, which is the uniform distribution. Update this viewer. This is how it looks like at the moment. Okay, so uniform distribution. Let's insert some chunk of code. U is a uniform distribution, and to generate, you use R uniform. R uniform passes the number of values you want. So, in case you're wondering how it looks like, it's just a vector of uniform distribution values. So, those are instances or samples drawn from a uniform distribution random generator. So if we want to plot the histogram of you, it should be flat between zero and one. It's not so flat, I know, I know, you need more values. It's flatter and flatter. It also depends on the breaks, how many bins you have. Okay, 100, 10, one, which doesn't make any sense. Okay, so this is a histogram. In case you want to plot it, from minus 5 to 5 with steps of 01. Let's call D uniform, right? See how it looks like. You can see, let's change the line style. So type is L. There you have it. It's a step. I don't need to look at the minus 5. Let's 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 do it too, right? In case you do this, you're going to get an error because they're not of compatible dimensions. There you have it. It's not so this is not a slope. This is only because of the resolution that I have. So if I have more points, this would tend to be a, a spike. Okay, it's an it's, it's, um, instantaneous transition at zero. Now, in case you want to change some parameters here, I have the min, which is the A, and the max, which is the B. So I don't want them to be zero, one. I want them to be two and ten. If I take a look here, they're between two and ten. If I want to do the same thing here, just pass it this argument, and you will see absolutely nothing with those values because your window is at minus two and two. Let's increase this to minus ten and ten here as well. There you have it. If you want to peek at eleven to make sure there's nothing after, there you go. You also have other functions such as mean and standard deviation. Let's compute the mean of the following vector. One, two, three. Should return two, right? 
You can also compute the standard deviation, 1 to 3, which is 1, 1 to 1, which is less, and 1, 1, 1, which is 0. Okay? Um, what else do we have? Let's generate a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. Well, I need a thousand values with a equal to 0 and b equal to 1 to return something close to 0.5. And it's not going to be the same value every time. And the reason why is because this is a random generator. So each time we have a thousand different values. So we're computing the sample mean. It's not the true mean. Now, as this increases, right, by the weak law of large numbers, this will tend to 0.5, right? So we talked about continuous random variables. We talked about mean and standard deviation. Let's... Consider now discrete random variables. So let's start with the Bernoulli. All you have to do is call R binome. I know it's a binomial distribution. There's no such thing as R Bernoulli. So R binome. And all you have to do is set the size or the N, if you recall here, binomial. So if N is 1, then you're summing up N Bernoulli. So your binomial is Bernoulli. So for the case of N equal to 1, you get a Bernoulli distribution. In case you want Bernoulli, you set the size or n, don't mix it up with this n. This n is the number of values you want generated from your random generator. So size or the number of trials or n is what you want to set to 1 to get a Bernoulli distribution. Now run to make sure what is missing. n is missing. So let's say I want one sample just to make sure. We're getting errors because we're not filling up values that should be filled. So they're not default values here. As you can see, x, size, and prob are not assigned values, like the log, for example, which is false. So those three parameters are compulsory. So let's pass the prob or the p value to 0.5, run, and this is a sample. Say I want more values. So I want a vector of size 100. There you go. Bernoulli samples. A histogram is not really what you want here. All you're going to get is two bars. You can see I have more ones than zeros. That's normal because n is low. It happened here that they're the same. Let's color this. Is there a col? Yes. Let's color it to something like red. Red is too... Okay, yellow is nice. I like yellow. Run. Each time you get different values. Now let's generate size thousand there you go now i'm going to copy paste the same code down here this time i want a binomial right a binomial and just before change this to binomial and now let's put size three so n is three it's not this n again this n is the size the guys that are programming didn't do a good job explaining this right so they should have called this p this n and maybe this one i don't know keep it size but no i mean this guy should be n this guy should be p and this one should be the size of the vector right anyway no it's not that bad they did an excellent job producing r of course so run as you can see i have three values zero one two and three the more this is I set it to ten you will see 11 bars so 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 now of course the probability decays with time so it will rarely happen that you would see a 10 so let me put 5 you see 6 bars but they're decaying with time so the more this is the smaller values you will have here right the less occurrence the less frequency you will have okay this will start looking like a normal distribution and there is actually a theorem or a property, I don't know what you can call it, it tells you that for large n, the binomial tends to a normal distribution. You can actually see this from the central limit theorem. If you go back here, the summation is nothing other than, of course, if you divide by an n, it becomes, as for large n, you can apply the central limit theorem here. So it's telling you that if you sum and divide by n, any IID variables with proper shifting and scaling, right? You will get a normal distribution. Well, that's what we have right here. We're not scaled properly, so let's scale it properly. So binomial minus, let's get the, 
the what is the mean hmm. so the mean of a binomial would be in this case so i have 10 so it's 10 p times 1 minus p so we can easily derive it i'm going to write it here so how do we derive the expectation so since it's discrete the expectation is defined as follows expectation of x is the sum of x and 0 down to n right because i have n possible values of x p of x so you will get 0 times p of 0 plus 1 times p of 1 down to n times p of you can do it the hard way. This is the hard way I call it the hard way. You can also observe that x is a sum of Bernoulli, right? So it would be something like the expectation of that would enter here. And you have n of those. And the expectation of each one of a Bernoulli is the same. So you get n expectation of xk, where xk is Bernoulli of parameter p. Now, what is the expectation of a Bernoulli, which is here? Let's go down here. Expectation of a Bernoulli would be nothing other than summation of x in 0 and 1, x, p of x. So it is 0, p of 0, plus 1, p of 1. Therefore, it is p of 1, right? Which is p. That's the mean. So right here, I would get n, p. So going back here. The mean of binomial or the mu, the true mean, is n times p. In my case, n is a thousand or ten. I'm sorry that this notation is confusing. Times p, which is 05. We're shifting and we're scaling right now by the standard deviation, which trust me, if you do it, you would get square root n times p times 1 minus p um if you don't believe me sorry it's in french because i'm currently in france loi binomial you go down here variance is npq what is q it's 1 minus p so the standard deviation would be the square root of that let's call it something else so std dev because sd is already taken okay and one last thing i have to do is multiply by the square root of n right to get the central limit theorem which i have here so if i take a look back here binomial minus sample serves as xn bar well that's not 100 percent true i still have to divide it by n right so that i get the sample mean because as we said binomial samples are sum of binomials so divide by n you get xn bar minus mu divide by standard deviation there you go multiply by square root of n and now I'm going to take this guy right here, call it X, and plot the histogram of X. I should be able to visualize a standard normal. I have an error here. What is it saying? Object N not found. Oh, I called it M. That's why. Okay, one thing you have to pay attention to is that the mean of the binomial samples over N is no longer n times p it's just p because you're dividing by n you're taking the summation then dividing by n and there you go so now you're centered with standard deviation one let's get more samples right here there you have it the smaller this is it won't work anymore right and if i have more breaks see how clean it is you're going to ask me a, a natural question here is but wait how come binomial samples which are discrete are going to tend to a normal distribution which is continuous well, that's the thing. You're summing up infinite terms. As n goes to infinity, the summation is, you know, it's kind of transforming to a continuous variable. That's the Riemann integration, if you, if you, if you will. Let's check out the Poisson distribution. Or let's say I want to see the histogram. So lambda is missing. Okay, lambda is missing. Let's set it to one. Is there anything missing? Yes. And now we have a Poisson distribution. There you have it. Let's take more points yeah so that's about it for distributions okay now let's resample a distribution and to achieve this goal let's do so using a for loop so I'm going to resample 10 times so for k in 1 till 10 right open and close curly brackets so let's plot a histogram each time of the uniform distribution each time i'm going to draw a thousand samples and let's pick a color which is sky blue and at the same time i'm going to you know i'm going to place a line which 
is of height 1 and I'll put a color which is red and run so there you have it so look what we're getting now you know the histogram reports the frequency so the number of occurrence you can easily translate this to a probability so you can go right here and just you know this set it to true run normally this should be one to report a cdf of uniform distributions this guy should be a pulse right like this between a and b which is zero and one should be on the red line but it's not because we're just drawing random variables so this is how it looks like with different samples when we resample okay um, i'm going to increase the number of samples and run again so as you can see they're approaching the red line more and more and when n goes to infinity or the number of samples here increases i get a better approximation of the density they're fluctuating less around the red line which is the true value okay good so that's about it that's it for this lecture where we discussed a lot of stuff we reviewed the basic stuff of probability and statistics started with the CDF then discrete and continuous um, definitions of the PMF and PDF we gave some discussions on joint CDF and what a PDF conditional PDF is we talked about how to compute an expectation of a function of a random variable which is again random we gave some descriptions of famous distributions that are both discrete and continuous we talked about important properties such as convergence in the sense of probability or distribution right and followed by some really known theorems such as the weak law of large numbers and the central limit theorem we welcomed you to estimators and estimation theory talked about what an estimator is a statistic is and given an estimator how i compute its bias and variance followed by what a consistent estimator is then we talked about the mse the bias variance trade-off what it means like to be a consistent estimator then we you know we showed you how to do some basic operations declare vectors matrices work with some more sophisticated functions um what a list is data frames as well visualizations like box plots scatter plots histograms then we went to the probability section where we sampled from normal distributions exponential the uniform distribution how to compute the mean and standard deviation using the r functions called mean and sd we also generated random variables from Bernoulli and binomial and Poisson distributions. And last but not least, we resampled from a uniform distribution multiple times. In the next one, we'll be going deeper into distributions and density functions. We'll talk about those and show you some applications in R. I'll see you in the next one.